Welcome to day number 10, and we are now in Luke chapter 23, and Peter, we're going to take a look at verses 44 through 49. Now, if you are familiar with the gospel of Luke, you know that the resurrection happens, that technically Easter tide, we should be looking at chapter 24, because that's when Jesus has risen. We're going to get to that. But because of what happens as Jesus dies here, there's kind of this foreshadowing of what's going to come, right? Mm -hmm. And in this text, I want to go ahead and read it. It basically says this. It was now about noon. This is about when Jesus dies. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Um, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed this last. At that moment, the text tells us that the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who gathered there, they beat their chests, and the women that had followed them from Galilee observed these things. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to focus on this was because of what happens as Jesus dies. In other words, we know that when Jesus is raised from the dead, that there's some very, there's some incredible spiritual things that happen. But I feel as though, especially chapter, verses 44 through 46 is kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come, right? So as Jesus dies, the text tells us that the curtain, the temple in the curtain is torn in two. There's another gospel that reports on the same thing. Right? So as we look at that, what is, what do you think that means for us? As we're looking towards the resurrection, we're looking towards Easter tide and what God's going to be doing. What, how would we view this kind of as a foreshadowing of what is to come? Well, I mean, I think there's something interesting in the fact that, uh, just on either side of Jesus dying, mm -hmm. you've got this good thief who puts real confidence in Jesus as someone that can get him into paradise. Yes. Put it that way. Right. And when the centurion, then the moment he dies, the centurion, a Gentile, mm -hmm. goes, oh, well, that was a, dikaios is the word, righteous or innocent or um, should not have been condemned. Hmm. Um, and it's this, um, it's this like deepening understanding, I think, of who Jesus is in light of his crucifixion. I mean, the resurrection is going to bring all this other stuff. Absolutely. It's going to kind of... It's the exclamation right. point, right? It's going to kind of cash all this out right. of what it would mean for a righteous person to die and then come back from the dead. Sure. Um, but yeah, so the centurion can kind of see... He can see something different in Jesus. Right. In the way in which he dies. And assumingly the centurion has seen a lot of people die this way. <laughs> right. So uh, he would know. Yeah. So what's interesting to note is what you have is you've kind of got this. I picture the centurion being right there. He's part of the execution committee. Oh, it is possibly worth saying that in the movies, Jesus is crucified like 15 feet in the air. But yeah. most crucifixions, their feet was a matter of inches like a foot off, off the, the ground. ground. So yeah. you can really look at the person. Right at somebody, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the idea would be then is that you've got this uh, Gentile, non-Jew. He's part of the execution team, mm -hmm. or at least guarding people so they don't get taken off the cross. And he watches Jesus die, and he comes to this conclusion there's something different about this guy. There's something unique. Maybe he's killed a lot of people. And he observes Jesus' death, and then he, it says he praises God and says, surely this was a righteous man. Now, what the text tells us as well is that while that's happening right in front and center with, G, with Jesus, that there's something happening in the temple. And the temple is the place where God touches earth. It's the place where heaven and earth um, cross, come across each other, right? And so at that moment, you've got the, the human reaction, but you've also got something supernatural that happens in the temple, yeah. right? So what's the temple part of this? Yeah, well, traditionally Christians think uh, um, that it's a symbol of God's sort of movement into the world somehow. So okay. the, the temple has a series of successively 
um, of concentric courts or structures. You call and, them chambers or rooms or yeah. yeah. And the one that's that's well, it's not physically at the center, but the one that's kind of at the center is the mm-hmm. Holy of Holies, you yes. know, Hakadosh Hakadoshim, and um, right. that is that is supposed to be where God lives. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot in the Bible about you know, there's nowhere I can go to escape God kind of thing. Right, right, right. But there's right. also this whole other way of describing the presence of God in which God lives in the temple. Right. It's often mentioned as the manifest presence of God. Yeah, something yeah. which is not itself a biblical term, but right. is the attempt to capture... That this, unique sacred yeah, space that, like, the, that is the temple. And yeah. so, well, there's this huge, very heavy... Um, I think it's a velvet cloth that it's goat's hair separates the yeah. the holy and it's of holies. really thick and really heavy. And it's heavy. got a particular design. It's like got the sun and the moon on it, and it's this kind of yeah. creation reflection. Well, if you go inside of that curtain and you do it wrong, you die. Yeah. Um, well, the Ark so, of the Covenant is right. in there, and kind of Raiders yeah. of the Lost mm-hmm. Ark esque. And so, yeah. when the curtain is torn, the mm-hmm. traditional Christian interpretation I think entails two things. One is it's a symbol that that presence is mm-hmm. now no longer exclusive to that particular room. So that the presence of God is now released right. into the world. Right. Yes. The other one would be that when the Holy of Holies is opened or exposed, yeah. it's a reminder that the Ark of the Covenant has never returned to Israel. Right. And so it's um, it's part of a larger theme in Jesus's career, mm-hmm. which is a condemnation of the temple as uh, less than what it was intended to be, right. you might say. So I would also add that it's this. It's that the temple is torn, which reveals the the sham of the fact that the ark was never returned. God's presence is released into the world, but now we're also invited in. Yeah, sure. Right? So it's almost like now people are invited into God's presence as God's presence now moves out into the world. And in many ways, it's pretty simple to understand that that movement is kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come in the resurrection of Jesus. And although, again, what we just looked at is not really part of Eastertide, because Eastertide is supposed to be restricted to from resurrection to Pentecost, but this event to me is just so unique. And it it just seems like it kind of reaches to the other side of the resurrection and pulls some of that prior to the resurrection as we see someone's heart at least moves towards God. I don't think either one of us would really say he puts his faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, right? It's kind of, I think that's a little bit of a stretch yeah. to say. Maybe he did. But really what he says is this is a guy that's obeyed the law. He's righteous. And um, and he takes note of that. So anyway, I just felt like it would be good for us to take a look at this episode. It's kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come at a much larger scale after Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Well, that's it for our time together. And so our prayer is throughout this Eastertide video series that you would really be sensing that the person of Jesus is coming alive to you as we take a look at these episodes from the life of Christ. So so what we're going to do now is move towards prayer. So let's all open our hearts to Christ by pray, uh, through faith and prayer, and let's pray together. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We pray in this moment that as we are part of this video, that your spirit would touch us. We ask Jesus as the one who came to pay for the penalty of our sin, that we would experience that personally and internally. And Lord, like this centurion, like this Gentile, Lord, help us to see things that many people may have missed about Christ. Help us to see it fully so that our hearts come alive towards you and we worship you. Lord, we pray for this and believe for this now in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you at tomorrow's video.